So I want to talk about observability and the glorious future and the inglorious past. <laughs> um, I've given this talk of uh, variations of it a couple of times, and people keep saying, you're so angry. I'm worried about you. You're so angry. Um, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Um, but um, I'm also just kind of excited. Um, and it manifests as anger because I come from ops. That's how we do. Um, <laughs> it's before 5 p.m., so I'm angry and gesticulating instead of angry and drinking. Um, you catch me later if you want to catch that, especially if you want to buy me a whiskey. Thank you for the nice intro. Um, yeah, so um, I am co-founder of Honeycomb. Um, I am a software vendor now, which is a really weird thing to adjust to after years and years of hating on vendors. Um, this is not a sales pitch. Um, it's more of a cry for help. <laughs> um, Eh, I'm trying to work in some of the ways that we're trying to think about it just because I think it's annoying for people when I'm being too like, oh, here are the problems. Maybe we have a solution. I don't know. I'll try and point out some of the things that I think that we do well. Um, but just ask questions if, if you have questions about our solution or, or any others. I'm happy to give demos too. Um, my background is a little bit relevant because um, I feel like we accidentally got to witness some really interesting solutions to problems of distributed systems. Um, because I, I was at Parse, we get acquired by Facebook, and there's, there's, this, there's this, you know, this pattern where the problem that the real world is having today, Google was having, you know, between five and ten years ago, um, Facebook was having, you know, two to five years ago, and, and that delta is shrinking. Right? Um, we're increasingly having the same problems, but we can still kind of peek into the future a little bit. Um, I would like to stress, though, that I think my product is not monitoring, and I think that we need to stop thinking about it in terms of monitoring because our instincts serve us poorly. All the things that we have trained ourselves to think about when it comes to understanding what our software is doing um, are not really monitoring related. I think that the right frame of mind is to think about it in terms of observability. And I'm not trying to start a war here, <laughs> unlike, uh, unlike my friend. Um, observability, though, is how we make complex systems tractable, right? Observability does not assume that something is wrong. You're not monitoring for something that is broken or fixed. Uh, you are trying to understand your software by instrumentation, and not just your software, but everyone's software, right? Vendor software. You need to be able to understand what your database is doing. You need to understand the code that you've written, the code that somebody else wrote five years ago that you're still stuck supporting. And I feel like the reason that, that we need to change the way that we're doing things um, I mean, we can, we can talk about this all night, which I will do with whiskey in my hand. But the critical thing is complexity. The, amount, the, the complexity of our systems, and everybody's yammering about this, you know, it's a hot thing to say. It's like, oh, complexity is increasing. Oh, it is. <laughs> it's like, it's really increasing. And the rate of change is getting faster, too. And, oh, right, I drew a, because, you know, science is really important to us. We're all scientists. So I drew a graph to illustrate complexity over time. <laughs> Science. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, our tools were designed, though, for a more predictable world. You, most of you look like you were alive for lamp stack days, right? We all kind of grew up with the lamp stack, where we got to choose between, uh, you know, Perl and Python, <laughs> MySQL and Postgres. Um, like, I'm not trying, to, I'm going to be super clear. I'm not trying to rag on the tools that we have that are mature. They're great tools. Like, if I could ever in my life build something as, that works as well as Splunk, I could basically retire um, and feel really good about myself. It's a very mature and amazing tool. I think isn't that cool. Um, but, but our tools were really designed to help us answer known questions faster, right? To take known unknowns and find solutions. They're really good at that. Um, with, the, with the kinds of questions that we have with modern paradigms, you know, microservices or distributed systems or, you know, even if you have like polyglot persistence or if you're doing IoT, it's like, don't know what the question is. Something's wrong, what? 
if I knew the question, the answer was probably very easy to find. You know, you as soon it's almost like you work backwards. You like you find an answer, and from there you can reason back to find the question, and it just doesn't work very well. Um, DBAs. All right, this slide was from a so full stack instrumentation. Full stack has been a punchline for so long. You know, I'm just giving up in the mic. I'm loud enough. Tell me if you can't hear me. <laughs> Uh, I feel like um, full stack has been a punchline for a long time, but in reality, we are building the full stack engineer right now, right? We're building all of the tools that you need that are good enough, like iPhone camera, like good enough, in order for you to actually own the stack, right? Um, the data layer uh, has, is something that, like we have this entire priesthood that's devoted to like caring for the data layer. And really, why? Mostly because the tools are so bad. Like a database is just a really fancy piece of software and nobody can tell what it's doing. Therefore, we create a very highly paid group of specialists. So let's talk about some, some of these questions. When I say questions are changing, like these are, these are like, okay, you got a LAMP stack, you have a website, and photos are loading slowly for some time, you know? And you can kind of jump pretty quickly to where the problem is and then do a deep dive on debugging it, right? S-Trace and like GV and like all these, all these single node tools that we have that are great, that are rich, but they're designed for, I know roughly where the problem is, I'm going to isolate it. Every single one of these like it causes an outage, you find it, and the first time that you encounter one of these problems, it's hard, right? It always is. An unknown unknown is always an engineering problem. It's open-ended. The first time you ever had a cache problem, you know, memcache notice down. It was a hard problem. And then after that, you're like, what do you do? You're like, well, I'm going to create a dashboard for this so I can jump straight to the answer next time, right? And over time, we accumulate these dashboards and dashboards and dashboards of dashboards to find our dashboards with our dashboards. Uh, every one of them represents a past failure, <laughs> a past outage, and, and people get their own, they get out of date, and... And when you, the way you're debugging with dashboards is not really debugging. It's not really asking questions or reasoning about your stack at all. You're pattern matching with your eyeballs. You're like, just like your eyes literally get tired sometimes. You're just like, oh, was it this one? Was it that one? Oh, I feel like I remember something that felt like this. There's a dashboard over there for that. Um, I think this is a, this is a really important distinguish, to distinguish. Like you're not actually asking questions. You are just scanning with your poor, overworked little eyeballs. So every team accumulates all these dashboards and they become very hard to maintain. And a lot of, this is why everyone who is a dashboarding provider is now starting to do, build in something that's a little bit more ad hoc, right? To let you kind of like craft them faster. Um, there's a lot of impedance mismatch when you're looking at modern systems that have maybe 40 or 50 or hundreds of small services. For example, here are some of the Instagram <laughs> issues that we had. Like one of our 50 services is slow, doesn't get hit all the time, gets hit sometimes, or maybe for, um, you know, it disproportionately impacts people who are loading a certain type of photo so it doesn't even hit all the people, the same person every time. Um, or it's not actually a it's not actually a problem at all. It's just an edge case in our code that is suddenly being revealed to us because somebody happened to complain about it and investigate it. Or you know it's in the database, but if you look at any one of those individual services, you won't find it because it only exists when you plug them together, like in the combination of these things. Sometimes, very often, it's non-deterministic. <laughs> um, and if you look at these. All three of these can exist at the same time for a very long time. Nobody knows about it. What makes it suddenly important? More importantly, how would you ever monitor for these things? Should you try? No, you should not. No, you should not. You will drive yourself batshit if you try to monitor for all of these things. If you have a paging alert <coughs> that alerts a human in the middle of the night, if 0.1% of your queries happen to be slower than the historical norm, all of your engineers are going to quit, and they should. <laughs> they really should. 
Once you know the question, though, you can find the answer very quickly. But how do you find these? Uh, you probably have a couple people who have been there longer than most people who have like built the system, who have a lot of intuition packed away. Um, it's, I, I've been this engineer so many times. I know what it feels like to be a hero. I was, I, I was, on, I was in Hawaii. Like, I'd been at Paris for like six months. I'm in Hawaii on the beach, no, no laptop. They're, they call me and they're like, we're so sorry. Paris has been down for an hour. Can you help? You know, I'm like, start asking questions. I'm like, oh, it's redness. I totally smell it. No, I know it's not there in the grass anymore, but I smell it. And I felt so good. You know, I'm like a hero. Like, I literally feel like high on life. It feels great the first time. Doesn't feel as great the fifth time or the seventh time. Doesn't feel as great for all the people who joined. The, the freedom to go on vacation and not get called is not a thing that you can do if you're relying on intuition and past failures to solve new problems. <sighs> Newer systems are way more subtle and way more complex. And this is self-inflicted. Like, let's be clear about this. The computers didn't do this to us. <laughs> We did this to ourselves because we were fixing the problems that we had. Like, for example, um, sites going down hard. We're like, ah, this is bad. Let's solve this by making things fail gracefully. Okay, well, now we have like a hundred different ways that things can fail very subtly and in various combinations. It doesn't go down completely, usually. Um, and, and this is better, right? This is a better world when it's not on or off. And pro tip. Your system is never completely up. <laughs> it's just not. Um, and if you think it is, you have bad tools. You have no idea how many catastrophic states, according to some people, exist right now in your stack. We brush them under the rug because we can't reproduce it. You know, it doesn't happen very often. Um, at Pars, around the time that we got acquired by Facebook, had 60,000 mobile apps or so that were being uh, hosted on Pars. And Someone would write in and be like, Pars is down. They're so angry because their entire livelihood rests on this app, right? And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> Behold my wall of dashboards. No red. <laughs> well, they don't actually care <laughs> about my beautiful dashboards, which I think is unfortunate. They care about their experience. And when I argue with them, I just lose credibility, right? You know this. I'm going to stop trying to convince you because I can tell you're already here. The point is, in the future, there are no easy problems left because you fix them, right? You're not just going, oh, that again, oh, that again, oh, that again, right? You fix them. That means that every time you do get paged, it should be something where you have to invade your brain and your creativity. It should always be a hard problem. And there's going to be a lot of them. There are a lot more of these weird edge cases that are kind of sort of up or maybe not really. And this is what drives us. <laughs> This is what drives us to drink. And this is why we need observability. And it has to be exploratory. It has to be open-ended. This is why we created Honeycomb. Because like anything that starts with a dashboard, it's starting with a stopping point. It's starting with a thing that you passively consume with your eyeballs. Uh, it's assuming that you already know what the answer is, especially if you're using anything that does pre-aggregation, which is every time series database ever. I just tell you how much metrics suck. Metrics are terrible and they should die in a fire. Almost all of them, except counters. Counters can live. That's a long story. Uh, why? Why do metrics exist? We had websites, big websites, uh, in the like late 90s, early uh, 2000s. And hardware was really expensive. <laughs> CPU, so expensive. Hard drives. RAM was like, oh, you get a megabyte, megabyte, you know, you get a megabyte of RAM. Have fun, go explore. We did not have the resources, but we had to be able to understand things. So we literally were just like, OK, I got all this information about what's going on. I'm going to care about this dot. <laughs> Everything else, just throw it away. All that context that you wish you had, right? And then slowly over time, we're just like, god damn, I wish I had some of that context back. I'm going to get tags. <laughs> Maybe some tags in my time series, you know? 50 tags. Sounds like a lot. Sure help to start finding our metrics, but like, what if you have a build ID, a monotonically increasing integer, and you want to be able to add, break it down by every single build? Now we're in the business of like reaping these all the time. What if you want to break down by every application ID or every user ID? Uh, people are so used to not being able to do this that they don't understand how, how unacceptable it is. 
exploratory, interrogatory, and questioning. This is, this is actually a hard switch to make back. We have found that it is easier for new grads who have never been like uh, put into the metrics mold. Uh, it's easier for new grads often to ask questions of their systems than crusty old folks like me who are using dashboards and metrics. Um, it's like muscle memory, um, but it comes back fast and it's really, really important. Once you've gotten used to it, this is how our brains work. Our brains work in events. They don't work in metrics. Uh, Metrics-based debugging, like, or as the rest of science would say, debugging, is just a lot more intuitive to us. I feel like it's really important that we start to get used to building consumer quality developer tools. I feel very strongly about this. Um, I don't know if you know this, but we engineers are people, too. <laughs> Subject to the same biases, like the same laziness, uh, as everyone else we build tools for. Why are our tools so shitty? <laughs> the other thing is that it, they have to be opinionated, right? We have to build opinionated tools because an opinionated tool is one that you can use your intuition. And you can use it like, like you know, you use it once or twice and suddenly it feels like a, a piece of you, right? You don't have to sit there and read the man page. Uh, only building like intuitive, uh, only building a strongly opinionated tools will let you have that. Um, I know, I need to speed up. I start ranting and then just, uh, and we also can't hold everyone to an impossible level of expertise. There's no like, you must be this tall to ride this ride. Like tools are not better the more obfuscated they are. Uh, although you would know that from some of the shits that we use. It's actually very, very, very important. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears. I'm gonna tell you, like, I feel like we are in, like, the first great wave of DevOps was like yelling at ops people to learn to do better code, right? To be better at software engineering. And great, great, good message, message received. Um, I feel like in the last year or two, we've segued into the second phase of DevOps, which is, all right, software engineers. <laughs> Time to learn to run your own services from end to end, you know, from design to maintenance, being on call for it. And people will start bristling like, oh, God, I don't want to be on call. It's miserable. Well, let's not make it miserable, right? The flip side of expecting everyone to be on call, and I believe that this is table stakes, is paying real attention and energy to the fact that it's not reasonable to ask anyone to give up their life to be on call. Absent an exceptional short-term situation, there's no excuse for it. Um, if you're a manager, one of your top three responsibilities should be graphing every week the number of times that your on-call gets woken up. This is another self-inflicted problem, right? I, I get it. I come from the ops land and DBA land, and I get why nobody wants to join us there. I'm sorry. I'm trying to do better. <laughs> You can't make everyone have to be an expert. When we're building our tools, we aim at literate technical support. You know, people who are tech literate. Uh, this makes it accessible. If you're complaining about not enough people being able to run their services and like be on call and like be, well maybe, maybe we need to make it more welcoming. Maybe we need to make it so that they don't feel like they're now doing two jobs. That's not actually reasonable, asking someone to do two jobs. Asking them to do their job a little bit better because they have a tighter feedback loop is an incredibly reasonable thing to ask. Debugging is a social act. It, it is a social activity even if it's just you, right? The mechanics are still social because you are, a collab you are engaged in collaboration between your past self, who is probably drunk, and your future self, who is definitely going to be drunk. And you have to leave, leave like breadcrumbs for yourself so that you can go back and figure out what you were thinking. It's the same as if you're dealing with someone else's mind. And I feel like we, <laughs> there's so much riches to be mined here because solving new problems is so cognitively expensive, right? Those engineering problems, those unknown unknowns are so expensive for us. Um, and what's the fastest, quickest way to make some of those things cheaper? Forget less stuff. Right? Share better. Uh, when I get paged, like, I don't want some predictive analytics, anomaly detection, Bayesian magic to tell me it thinks the problem's over there. I want to know what the last person on my team who got paged about this 
what questions they asked and what they ruled out and what notes they left themselves and what they published to Slack. You know, the basics. That's what I want to know. And most of us are doing this with our tools now. They, our tools are just fighting us on it. In the future, observability must be event-driven. It cannot be pre-aggregated. Like, I can't stress this enough. You have to have access to those raw rows, those raw original rows. This is one of those things that leads to so many of the pathologies and the tools that we all use every, all the time and we hate, and we've internalized these limitations. They're not necessary. But you have to have access to those raw events. Things like, you know, oh, I was at Monorama the other week, and people were like, oh, you can't have like percentile aggregates for, you know, something, something. And I'm like, yeah, you can. Read time aggregation, motherfuckers. Like, does not have to be aggregated at right time. And I think that you need to look for, like, we, we do this. Uh, all the distributed tracing stuff does this. If you look at the tools of the future, the, the things that Google and Facebook were writing a couple years ago, they are all event driven. And P.S. Uh, structured data is assumed. I could rant about that for an hour. Um, and get used to sampling. You have to sample at scale. And we are all increasingly running at scale. If you're not building a billing system, don't build it with a lossless assumption, which is wrong anyway. You knew that. Uh, events tell stories. Events help us like, reconstruct what happened and the causality and the correlations. The closest mental map, map to the tool we have today is logs, because logs are just baby events. They haven't grown up yet. They still have their baby teeth. They haven't gotten some structure. Joe Beta and I got into an argument on Twitter the other day about this, and I was like, God, I usually think Joe Beta's right about everything. Am I wrong about this? He's like, no, it's like structured, unstructured logs are good for something. And then I realized he's talking about his eight-year-old. Fine. Your eight-year-old can use unstructured logs. By the time she's 10. <laughs> Aggregates destroy your precious details. Every time series database does this. It takes a section of time, maybe it's just a second, that sounded really good to me a, a couple years ago, and then just like squishes everything together. If you're dealing with data, you need those outliers. You need that 99.99th percentile. You need the max. You need the min. You need to be able to get back to the source of truth that when this thing happened, when this value was reached, all these other exact values were that. Tags are not good enough. Um, I think that there's a couple of ways you can, you can think about this. Um, one is to remember that in the future, we're assuming that the easy problems are taken care of, remember? And that means that every problem that's left is an individual. Every single one of them is, is a needle, right, that you're looking for in the haystack. But it's not a haystack, it's like a stack of needles. And they're in motion, so it's like a tornado of, of needles. Um, and that's what your debugging life looks like in the future. But it's fine. It's fine, because we have better tools. You cannot hunt needles if your tools don't handle this. And this is referring to the ways that the bits get stored on disk. We had to write our own storage engine. Nothing out there would do that. It's not very complicated. I like to think of it like, as like an optimized file format. But like. You need those raw events. Baron Schwartz does this with MySQL. But I think Baron Schwartz is the only person in the world who could do that with MySQL. <laughs> High cardinality is not a nice to have. Like, that, those people that would write in at Parse would be like, Parse is down. Well, as soon as we got into Facebook Scuba, we went from being like, huh, I'm going to dispatch an engineer to go and like spend half a day looking for something that may or may not exist, because maybe they forgot to turn on their Wi-Fi, to just going, oh, Slice by that application ID, hmm. slice and dice by every combination, you know, endpoint, sort, reverse by, you know, uh, latency. <laughs> and uh, then look at queries. Maybe it's something stupid like they just deployed a query that is doing a 5x full table scan of the uh, user collection every time someone logs in. Five clicks. Easy. Easy. These are easy problems with the right tools. Black swans are the norm. Another way of saying needles. All right, I'm going to like speed through this a little bit because there's a couple other things I want to get to. Your observability has to bind teams together, not build silos for teams. And your tools need to make discovering an individual event, any, any event in your system needs to be findable. You know, unique request IDs, mm, pretty important. Um, if you cannot find, any individual unique request um, is not good enough. 
the future belongs to generalist software engineers. Um, I come from ops and data, right? We're not going away, but we increasingly exist on the other side of an API. And you have to start getting used to the fact that your ops people, your DBAs, work for Amazon or Google or you know a bunch of us. They work for me, right? Uh, you don't get to assume that they sit next to you anymore. And if you're like one of my tribe, like we need to start pushing them out of the nest, <laughs> right? Pull requests, make sure that they're structuring their data, they understand what they're doing instead of just spoon, spoon feeding it to them. Uh, this, this trend is not going to stop. <laughs> this is why for Honeycomb, it's, uh, it is built for software engineers. It's SDKs and APIs. That's it. We're trying to do basically for observability what Docker just did for release engineering. Because think about it, Docker is not about containers. Containers are decades old. Just say that to anyone who's ever used Solaris, their like, head explodes, or just angry about it. But it's funny. <laughs> but it's about release engineering. It's about providing the primitives good enough so software engineers can self-serve in a reusable, repeatable, good enough, safe enough way. We have to do the same, and not just us. Like We need a lot more services out there doing this for software engineers, empowering them to own their stuff. It's table stakes. Don't hire any software engineer who doesn't play ball. Don't promote anyone to senior software engineer if they don't own their stuff. They're setting an example for your entire organization. This doesn't happen by accident, you know? It often happens quietly, so people don't recognize the work that's being done, but it doesn't happen by accident. It's so important that we watch our code run in production. Like, it blows my mind that we still run unit tests, watch it run on our laptops, and ship it, and don't look at it. It sounds so obvious, but like, I understand we haven't had the tools. I got to Facebook, and it is, it is considered irresponsible not to go look at what you just shipped to see if there's anything you didn't predict that happened. Right? Draw a little nice little vertical line whenever something goes out. You go, you're like, I predict that my major change or big diff is going to make a couple of these, you know, impacts or no impact. You know, the dark dog that didn't bark is even more fun to find. Uh, but you go and you look at it. And honestly, this is addictive. The dopamine hit that you get from finding an unknown unknown before it even affects anyone. <sighs> It's super fun. It's super fun. Like the future is better. The future is better. And your reward. Here's my philosophy of paging. The only paging alerts that you should have on your system are for your KPIs. You should have error, request per second, you know, latency, um, and just like health checks, you know, write an object, read it back. Only thing you need to page on. Everything else that you're paging yourselves on are symptoms. And any symptom by itself should be okay, right? Unless your customers are being impacted. You wake people up when your customers are suffering. And that's it. And the reason, like we all say this, and the reason that people don't do it is because they don't trust their tools to help them find those unknown unknowns. So they page themselves about a cluster of symptoms. It's like a syndrome, right? They page themselves about a cluster of shit so that maybe it'll like kind of hazily pattern match to a past failure. <sighs> yeah, anyway, I'm about done. Um, I think that this is the main takeaway. If, I, if there's one thing, oh my God, I didn't edit that. It's 2017. Anyway, Gregory said, said this last year at uh, Monorama. He said, it seems like if I just think about it as a distributed system, I'm kind of most of the way there. And I'm like, yes, yes, it's so true. It is so true. And the reason is because all of the CS stuff, you know, that they do in their academies, I didn't study CS in school. <clears throat> I mean, they're super important degree uh, factories. Um, distributed systems principles are about dealing with complexity gracefully, right? That's what it is. It isn't about where geographically your shit lives. <laughs> It's about how do we degrade gracefully? How do we how do we retry? How do we, you know? And and it's amazing how far this can take you. I, I love that. It's super fun. Uh, no matter if you think of yourself as running distributed systems or not, learn about how they work. Have it in your mind, and just like it'll be fine. In the glorious future, you need all of these things. 
Uh, I also like thinking of it as like TDD for production, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you see what you're going to expect uh, and then you just like look at it in real time and uh, whoops, meant to delete that, but uh, I'm done. I just want to show you a couple of screenshots of like what I think are um, the best tools out there, like old, you know, static dashboards and monitoring these handcrafted like monstrosities um, that sit there and don't change. Um, don't get me wrong. I think you should still have a dashboard for every one of your KPIs. Good, right? That's all you need. That's all you need. These are some screenshots of Honeycomb. Um, and, yeah, you, know, you, you can poke around. I don't care. I don't want, I'm starting to feel icky like a vendor. Never trust a vendor. Present company not excluded. Like, trust no one. But my shit is the best. <laughs> So also, I really love what the open tracing kids are doing. Like, so so like Zipkin and open tracing of Lightstep stuff. Um, like it was it's it was uncanny. Like Christina and I spent all last year trying to figure out how to talk about this problem, how to how to, and we kind of intentionally did not look around at the rest of the world. I went, I, I go and look at their stuff, and they're using the same words, and they're they're preaching the same gospel. And I think that the way you can think about us versus them is that the tracing is depth first, you know. Uh, and, and Honeycomb is breadth first. I think that one of the most interesting problems with tracing is what do you trace, right? If it's something that happens once every million requests, why do you trace? And you don't know why. If you knew why, you didn't have to trace it. it drives you mad. Um, with Honeycomb, that's really easy, right? Um, but yeah, like open tracing in a nutshell. They just wrote down all the same things. It's, it's great. It's great. And this is a this is a view of like the open zip kit. And you can see how it just so so much of the the stuff with the microservices is what's happening. Every single node is useless unless you're stitching it together. And you can see really beautifully here how it, how it focuses on what's happening between between the hops and ordering them. You can do all this in Honeycomb too, just by giving unique request IDs, propagating them throughout the stack, searching for it, and ordering. So. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Everything already works perfectly for all of you. Yeah. So you, you, you stole my wind in front of and I was planning on asking you about it, open tracing. Like, Big fan. Just another minute about like. Can you use the stack? Can you uh, access the tracing that outputs by the tracing system? How would how would you use both? Oh, okay. So uh, so Honeycomb, uh, we just at our API, we we just accept JSON blobs arbitrarily wide JSON blobs. You can have up to like the number of open files in a Linux system. So up to like, you know, tens of thousands of key value pairs. And then all of them are equally weighted. So you can aggregate and all of them just slice, slice, slice. You know, it's a kind of a BI type of approach thinking, you know, business intelligence where you're like, instead of just like crafting up this mammoth question and hitting go and then waiting an hour, like Splunk. It's more like, start here. Oh, what about this? Oh, that's interesting. Break down. Oh. Oh, what about this? I'll take that out. You know, it's a kind of iterative, it's just exploratory. Um, getting stuff in, though, is just JSON. So if you can turn strings into JSON blobs, we can automatic, that's all you need to do. We have SDKs, we have uh, helpers. Um, it is much harder to, to do the distributed tracing. That's the big hurdle, is that there's a lot of instrumentation that you have to do before it is even minimally useful, right? With ours, it's like you can just drop it into one service, one database, and just kind of build it up over time. Um, the big problem, and, and they're working super hard in this, and it's a hard problem, it, it takes you a while to build up enough instrumentation for it to be useful, and I don't know of any really good shortcuts for that, unfortunately. They, prob they probably have a better answer than that, but it's, it's kind of a hurdle. Does that answer your question? Okay. Anything else? Yeah. How, how do you address the privacy and security issues in that not everybody that the developer mm -hmm. is going to be authorized from a privacy and security standpoint of coverage? So, <laughs> privacy and security. Um, so, we, we are SaaS only, and we have a product, like if the question is compliance data, we have a thing that lets you run it as a pure SaaS without ever shipping your data off your premises. It's super cool. Um, it's not public yet. Um, but in terms of internally, 
So one thing is, um, this is supposed to be analytics data, your systems data. You know, none of us are building this primarily for sensitive data, for exploring sensitive data. That that shit costs way more, <laughs> and is terrible. Uh, but we're, we're explicitly not addressing the sensitive data thing. Now, like, we have ACLs and roles you can delegate, or you can have, you know, some people only have access to some data sets. But, like, fundamentally, your goal should not be to have super sensitive data in any of your logs or your events anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just since we're in a serverless track, mm. you know, are, oh, yeah. what are sort of particular, um, I don't know, challenges yeah. of observability? Yeah, so the big problem with observability that everyone's having is that they're like, yay, I got all my stuff implemented on the serverless, and then something goes wrong, and they're like, where'd my request go? Like, where'd it go? Like, in Amazon, I saw it here, and then oh, just vanished. Um, that's funny. Um, so... With Honeycomb, we are very, very well suited to that sort of thing. You just like fire off events periodically whenever anything interesting takes place within the execution of your code. And it's pretty easy. It's just like, you know, GDB or stepping through it remotely, but with like a little bit of a blindfold on. <laughs> um, but like you can't run an agent, right? With serverless stuff, you can't, you can't really, you don't have any control over the other side. So you have to rely on the SDK and API type of, of model. Uh, I don't know for distributed tra tracing what they do. But this is a big problem, right? Everybody who's used to like my dashboards and my data dog and everything. And then and then like if you if you set up, you know, that the, the plugin that they some of them will write, well you're still trusting them to gather the right thing at the right point and like adding more things firing off at the place that you suspect it might be is really hard. It's really hard. I don't know. Is anybody doing anything awesome that they love for serverless monitoring or observability? There's that one startup that was founded just to do uh, observability from AWS Lambda. What's it called? IOPipe. IOPipe. Um, they seem really smart. Um, I'd say no, but I think that is the key problem. Yeah, totally. Totally is. And that's why I don't think it's ready for prime time, honestly. That and the fact that like every time you start talking about state or data, everyone just kind of goes trails off and goes, well, it's probably fine. You know, I mean, there's no concept of like replayability or an event log or like, which is great if you have a toy, right, or a class project. But if you're going to run a real business, uh, get a database. Sorry, my personal opinion. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Thank you so much for having me.